Let's get started. We're uh, right at about 100 people, so um, that's a good crowd in my book. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Jan Feldman. I'm the Executive Director of Lawyers for the Creative Arts, and welcome to this program called Keys to Film Law. This is our inaugural uh, session. Um, it's an ambitious title, and you'll see we've assembled a team that's uh, completely up to that task, up to the title. I do want to say before we get started that um, uh, this is a program that we are doing in conjunction, in partnership with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, and especially the Chicago Film Office, Kwame Amoku, Thavari Crouch, and John Hunreiser um, are very able partners in this, and we thank them uh, for all they've done in, in helping us to assemble this. Um, as I indicated, this is a series. This is the first of a series. Um, we're anticipating about five additional uh, uh, segments in addition to this, the current one. And, and uh, the basic concept is to take you through um, the legal aspects of making a documentary film. And, and that probably won't be entirely limited to documentary, but that's kind of the uh, independent film, I guess is the better way to put it. Um, and we'll take it through step by step, kind of from a lawyer's perspective, but also a practitioner's perspective. Um, uh, and so we're hoping to, to bring both of those um, uh, important aspects of filmmaking uh, into, the, into the conversation. Uh, we'll go through today's, um, today is the acquisition of rights, but we move on to assembling the key players and contracts with them, financing issues, and production and distribution. So it's sort of a, a cradle to, I don't want to say grave, that's the wrong ending point, but cradle to actual distribution and viewing. Um, as I said, we have a, a great uh, group here today. Um, I, I'm, I want to mention that I'm also here with my uh, colleague, Chris Johnson from Lawyers for the Creative Arts, and the two of us will be fielding chat questions. So um, the program will probably run, the basic uh, uh, program before questions will probably run in the neighborhood of 45 minutes, and then we will um, open it up to questions. But in the meantime, uh, and acknowledging that there's a lot of people in the room, if we get a flood of questions, we may not get to them all. Um, if you have questions in the middle that you think might be um, appropriate for someone, the speaker or one of the speakers or all of them to respond to, send us a chat. Uh, do it on the chat. Um, and uh, probably the best thing to, to do would be to address it to myself or Chris Johnson, and we'll, we'll go through it that way. Um, we may just have to, we have to exercise some discretion in terms of, of timing and as well as um, when it's appropriate to raise these various questions. So uh, Chris is telling me to do it in the Q&A box. I see there, so that's a better place. Forget chat, forget I said that. Um, Chris is the keeper of the technology here. Uh, in any event, let me introduce briefly the, the speakers. Um, uh, Jolene Pinder is the executive director of Kartemkin Films. Um, Brian Hagelke is the co-founder of New City and the New City Film Project. Uh, Patrick Wimp is the um, uh, founder and a screenwriter and director of Digital Hydra. And Tom Levins, who is our moderator and, and sort of the organizer of this program, is a partner at Mandel Menkes. All Everybody's going to give a little bit more of an introduction to themselves, but uh, Tom is a longtime um, important figure at the Lawyers for the Creative Arts. He was actually our first full-time executive director. We named a award after him. Um, and he has been just a tremendous uh, supporter and advisor to me and, um, and others uh, who are trying to run Lawyers for the Creative Arts. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Lawyers for the Creative Arts is a legal service organization that provides pro bono legal assistance to folks, individuals, and organizations in the arts. We've been around for 48 years, uh, so we're getting, our, getting the feel for it at this point. And um, we are there to help people in the arts. We, are, we have our website at law-arts.org. Uh, you submit applications for legal help. Uh, we also run a pretty vast uh, series of, of um, educational programs, of which this is one, um, for people in various areas of the arts. This one, of course, is focusing on film, but we, we uh, uh, present programs in all areas of the arts to uh, folks that are that are actually doing the arts rather than lawyers who are helping them do the arts. So I think that's kind of it for my introduction. And with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Tom Levins. Well, thank you, Jan. That was very kind. I appreciate that very much. Um, I um, uh, will um, be moderating today, but uh, my, my role as a moderator is 
is not uh, to exclude questions from the panel to me or questions from uh, the panelists to each other. So we're going to look at this as kind of a kind of a dialogue. And uh, I'd like for each of you to uh, provide whatever additional introductory information that you'd like, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Brian, let's let's start with you. You're you're muted, Brian. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm Brian Hagelke. I'm the uh, co-founder of New City, so which has been uh, a publication in Chicago for 34 years now. And uh, so my, I guess my first uh, experience with rights has always been in the arena of journalism um, and artwork and things of that nature, where um, our practice for the entire history of that magazine and through today is the handshake. So we don't use contracts and we don't do any of the things that we do on the film side. So I kind of live in this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde universe when I'm spending half my time being, you know, literally just operating a business on the basis of uh, our reputation and relationships. And the other half of the time is in this film side, which is, um, you know, mountains and mountains and mountains of paper, you know, both literal and uh, theoretical um, as we as we do it. We, we got into the movie business four years ago. We've produced uh, three feature films, and um, the first of which, Signature Move, world premiered at South by Southwest and has gone on to do various things. The second one, Knives and Skin, which came out last year, was uh, Berlin and then Tribeca and uh, sold to IFC. It's currently streaming on Hulu. And our third, Dreaming Grand Avenue, um, is finished now, but not yet released. We're working on a release plan. In addition to that, we're launching um, a Chicago Film Fund uh, to help finance uh, both our projects and possibly some of the other projects that are being done around town. And uh, I think that's the, the bulk of it. Great. Thank you, Jolene. You're muted, so... Sure. Thanks, Tom. Uh, my name is Jolene Pinder, and I'm the executive director of Kartemquin Films in Chicago. Um, for those of you who may not know, Kartemquin is a nonprofit that specializes in documentary film uh, with the aim to spark doc democracy through documentary. And we've been around for 54 years, and over that time, we've produced we're right around 70 films at this point in time. This year happens to be a banner year for us in terms of the number of films that were coming out, um, including one that's coming out in a few weeks, um, Unapologetic, at the premiering at the Black Star Film Festival, uh, directed by Ashley O'Shea. Um, and we have um, a film called Represent this year about women in politics by Hilary Batchelder, um, Steve James's City So Real, Maria Fenitza's Dilemma of Desire, and Jenny She's Finding Yang. So, it's a big year, very different kinds of films, um, different kinds of arrangements to talk about. Um, and on the other side of the work that we do co-producing films, we have a number of um, filmmaker support programs. So we run a program called Diverse Voices and Docs that supports filmmakers of color um, as they're developing their films. And, um, and that's one of our signature programs as well. So there's the feedback loop between the co-producing um, and the alumni community from those programs. So. Um, we, I, well, I'm sure we'll talk more about, you know, the different unique challenges of documentaries um, as you're considering these rights questions. Okay, thank you. Pat, and you're on mute too. Got it. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of the um, more like singular independent filmmaker of the group. Uh, my company, Digital Hydra, was built by myself and my business partner um, to really serve our creative output. And uh, I've been making films independently for now over 12 years. I've really run the gamut of experiences there um, from feature films to we've, you know, written, produced, directed um, multiple seasons of international TV series. Uh, we do commercials, music videos. Um, I've got a, a web series that's currently negotiating a deal with a, a much bigger studio up in LA. So, um, you know, really kind of my interactions with rights are around those things, right? Building projects. I, I, I build them wholesale, um, usually based on my own creative. So there's kind of multiple levels that I'm dealing with rights acquisition um, and lawyers are very helpful in doing that. Terrific. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So context for what we're going to do today. Uh, the What we're looking at, is, as Jan said, is the 
kind of the, the lifespan of, of a film. So we're in the beginning here where you conceptualize that you want to produce a film. And I'm not sure where the idea came from, but you've got to start with rights in some kind of way because um, you know, filmmaking, we know, is a collaborative process, but it's very much a derivative process. With very few exceptions, most films are going to be relying upon some underlying right of some kind. And um, the rights we're talking about aren't necessarily the ones that come through talent agreements with a director or an actor or something like that. That's important, of course, but uh, or, or not a, produce, a production kind of agreement, like a location agreement, for example. Again, important, but what we're looking at here are, are agreements from in the beginning that will be important in affecting affecting what the uh, the content of the the film is going to be and we're really looking at three different areas of of legal protection generally for uh for for the rights that we're talking about here the first one is, is copyright and that's probably the most important that's the one that's implicated in in most of the films because you you've got to perhaps start with a story and then you've got a script and you may have some underlying works that have been adapted for either that story or the script. It could be a book, it could be another movie, it could be a song, it could be an article, it could be a poem. Things like that are, are adapted and there is a, a story, if you're Christopher Guest, it's an outline, um, but uh, if you've got a script, then um, that's what is, is used to create the derivative work, which is the, uh, is the film. The other category, is uh, life rights and those are rights that individuals would have in their identity either right of publicity or their their right of privacy and so uh it's 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 not a copyright right it's it has to do with a personal right of an individual to be depicted in your film and then the third category would be would be trademarks and that's probably not used a lot but you can think of it for our purposes as, as being the, the corporate identity uh, you want to make a Lego movie, and create Lego characters, well, you got to have the rights to the Lego trademark. So if, you know, if you're inspired to do Lincoln Logs and make characters out of Lincoln Logs, you got to go to Lincoln Logs. Or if you wanted to have a, a, uh, a, a movie that was called Starbucks and it was about Starbucks people or something or Facebook or whatever, you'd probably be looking at some certain trademark rights uh, there. So, um, the uh, that those those are the three main areas that the, the the law affecting those areas are are implicated in the rights agreements we're talking about here and we i don't want to scare people about these rights agreements but they you have to take a very long view about um about those agreements in the sense that they're going to be reviewed over and over and over again during the lifespan of, of the film it's going to be viewed by investors is going to be perhaps viewed by other people who are going to be joining your team it's going to be uh, uh, other producers sales agents distributors other attorneys accountants uh, it's going to be gone over many many times so it's something that you have to not only get right but you have to prepare in anticipation of that long view that this is going to be affecting decisions that are going to be made for um, you know quite some time all right so with that uh, that introduction and that in that context, I'm going to start with a, a question first for for you, Brian, and that is that um, if you would describe your experience with acquiring rights in a property, how when that gets started, how it gets started, and kind of a second prong on that, if you could describe uh, uh, what was the role of your attorney in that uh, in that process, and you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so the, the three projects that we've made have all um, been projects that somebody, typically the director, but I guess in the first case, it was the co-producer and star um, had written and brought to us. And the, I think the, and then we have, before we did this, before we made these films, we had, a couple of aborted attempts at securing rights to properties that were in estates where the, the creator was deceased and we were dealing with either an agent for the estate or in another case, the, uh, the widow of the person. And both of those 
fell apart in the rights process. So I've kind of had that experience of uh, not being able to get something done that we wanted to do because of this very stage of the process. But with the what I've found with the others that we've licensed so far, it's been pretty organic because the filmmakers come to us as sort of the the producers and the production company. They're going to make their dream which is maybe their screenplay and and their idea of a movie into a reality and so they're um very cooperative in the process and um you know typically we'll um we'll spend some time with somebody getting to know each other a little bit before we license the actual underlying intellectual property and you know that that's um that's the nature of the projects we're doing you know if we were dealing with bigger higher profile things we might have to move more aggressively to license from almost day one but in our situations it's um we need to reach a certain comfort level that we want to do the project as well we don't really want to tie up something with an option say and um and then decide we don't want to do the project i mean that could happen but we don't you know we 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 view the 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 process is you need to have a little bit of a courtship for a little while till you to make sure you really want to work together with somebody. Okay, good. Um, Jolene, what uh, right. is your experience here in acquiring rights agreement? When, when does that start in the process for you? Sure. Well, you know, for us with Cartemco, in terms of just how we work with filmmakers, um, you know, we often have a relationship with a filmmaker or they've come through, um, you know, one of our development programs. And um, there's a few different options that we've really spent the last year plus devising with our lawyers of how do we enter into a contract around the film project with filmmakers. Um, and there's one where the copyright retains at Kurtemquin, is retained at Kurtemquin. Um, and that means forevermore we manage that film, you know, it could be many years later, the filmmaker isn't interested in continuing to like, um, you know, sort of manage the distribution of it. We continue to do that. We are, we can archive it. Um, so that's where the copyright retains and stays at Kurtemquin. There's another agreement that we can enter into if the filmmaker chooses to have um, retained their copyright. That's more of like a production service agreement. That's how we work with filmmakers. In terms of how we work with, um, how our filmmakers often work with the participants in their films, um, you know, from how, if you look at the sort of body of work that Cartemquin um, has put out, these are very um, sort of personal documentaries often and really strong connections with the participants in the film. So that trust building process is, is really critical in the earliest stages of development. And, you know, the first legal document that's usually engaged there is a personal release. And that's really critical. We, we tend not to do life rights with people. Um, there's been perhaps one instance, um, you know, in our past where a producer was interested in representing the life rights because that producer wanted to also, you know, be part of a feature film, a narrative film. Um, we're typically not doing that. Um, so we really, our legal arrangement with the participants rests on the foundation of that personal release, which our lawyers have obviously, you know, vetted and approved. Um, I mean, we have, we had a really challenging situation where our lawyers had to be very engaged because um, we couldn't get a release from a person who was elderly and was actually, their, their legal guardian was their daughter. Um, and the film moved forward and we went to court. Uh, so uh, we're engaged in a legal um, uh, legal battle over that. So we've certainly seen the hit of not having a really rock solid personal release from the very start. But that's that's what we educate our filmmakers to do is get that release, you know, from the moment you you start filming. Um, but in terms of a, a life rights agreement, we're we're typically not engaging in those. We look at it from the back end of. Um, sort of what's ethical in terms of engaging the participants in the in the waterfall um, for the for what they've given to the project. Okay. Well, you mentioned lawyers. It sounds as if they're very, that they're present very early in your process. They are. We we work closely with Holland and Knight, and um, they are present throughout every part of our process. Um, we work with them. I mean, we are usually having a, a pro, you know um, an engagement with them on a pretty much weekly basis, whether or not they're reviewing a broadcast agreement or they're, you know, helping us devise these contracts for how we work with filmmakers. They're, they're very engaged in our process and they're okay. amazing. 
Good. All right. Okay, Pat, uh, you're on mute too. So oh, there you go. So uh, your, your thoughts and, and you can give thoughts from both your perspective of being producer, but critically, I guess, as, as a, a screenwriter. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, as, as these guys kind of alluded to, it's, it's pretty specific from project to project, but, um, you know, in general, locking things down and making sure they're very clean uh, early on is something that I want to do no matter what that project is. So, you know, we're engaging with attorneys um, right off the bat. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, that could be, um, you know, just making sure there's like a clean chain of title. Let's see, like I co-wrote a screenplay with somebody else, right? And then we're going to go make that movie. Um, if it's just going through my production company, like what's, you know, what's the kind of ownership agreement? What, you know, what is the copyright status? Um, establishing those things, um, you know, kind of moving forward from there, um, it becomes, you know, even if you think about, um, you know, making sure that you have your, your contracts in place for talent and things like that. Like once you move to the actual production, um, you know, having your agreements for actors and, and all that, as, as you guys mentioned, you know, the, the lifespan of this stuff is going to be long. And, you know, eventually if you get to um, that dream spot where you're talking to distributors about your movie, like they're going to want to see those things, right? They're going to want to know who owns it, who, you know, who's, you know, who you have rights to. Um, I've had um, films that got into kind of nightmare situations with music rights where, uh, you know, the, the movie was kind of like an independent fun movie. We got, um, you know, rights to do festival distribution for a bunch of like, you know, hit songs and pop songs. But then people came around wanting to buy that music and chasing down the rights for that, um, you know, ended up becoming a major headache that kind of got in the way of getting that film distributed. So, you know, through some of those kind of suffering experiences, um, I just, you know, I want to take the time to make the effort on the front end to make sure things are clean in, in whatever, you know, terms that means. And, and that usually means doing the paperwork, right? I think that um, since this is kind of a, a dreamer type business, no, no matter what side of it is you're, you're working in, right? Since it's creative, um, there can be a lot of energy around like, let's get up and do it. You know, let's not worry about that. Like, let's, let's just move. Um, but, you know, you really want to actually take the time to do it right on the front end in my experience um, so that, you know, you can get the thing as far as you actually want it to go. Okay, and I'll just make one comment just based on my own personal experience and uh, being involved with uh, the uh, Chicago Media Angels and, and looking at a lot of life rights agreements and uh, have, have been in a position where I've had to say, this is not any good. We're not going to be able to raise money on this. We're not going to be able to um, uh, get, get a distributor involved because, because this is an adequate agreement. And it, it just it just doesn't have what is necessary to to uh, to justify putting money down on it. There might have been something that uh, a person was was prepared to put their own efforts into in some kind of way, but unless it unless it was the, the right document, then nobody else was going to do the same same thing. So I just want to support what you said, um, Brian. Uh, let, in, in terms of talking about the terms of some of these uh, rights agreements, maybe we can just start from you saying what, from your perspective, is the most significant term that you that you uh, feel in the agreement is, is is necessary for you to be able to go ahead. I know that 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 leave. I don't mean to leave out everything else, but if there's something that you can kind of rank, what would this be the most important for you? Their signature. <laughs> 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 um, their signature in their check <laughs> exactly no I think um, I, you know I, 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 that's a good question I mean like I said we've had good luck I think with our rights negotiations since we stopped doing business with dead people um, in the sense that um, we haven't had a lot of vigorous back and forth over these agreements and um, we've tried to create something and, uh, you know, just full disclosure, Tom has been the lawyer for all, everything we've done in this in, in this arena. But I think when we talked about this at the very beginning is we wanted something that would uh, secure the rights in such a way that we could do everything we needed to do as a 
as a film, but that would also be fair to the other side. In other words, we don't go into this thinking about this as a zero sum game with uh, us and the uh, the other party to an agreement. Rather, it's we're trying to make something that benefits both of us. So I think we've crafted a basic agreement that we use now that is th that serves that purpose. And so we just haven't had a lot of pushback on terms of it. But I mean, I think if I was to think about what's most important, obviously it's securing um, those rights in perpetuity without, you know, um, exit clauses and other things that could diminish your ability to distribute the film. Although I think it'd be interesting to have a conversation about whether um, this stuff is, is evolving now uh, in, the, in the streaming world, you know, um, that's a little bit of a side topic, but what, what our experience has been is that with some of the, the streamers tend to be less onerous in their requirements than distributors are in terms of uh, the chain of title. Okay, so you'd say scope of rights and uh, the security of those rights have been, been the most important yes. from your perspective. Okay. Jolene, from I, what, what's the most important with respect to, I know you don't do life rights necessarily, but you do do releases. So, um, well, what, I, I, was, I, was, I mean, I, I, you know, I think one of the things about when you're working in the documentary space is, um, and when people are coming on board, um, you know, your release might not spell all of this out, but being really clear on the long tail of a documentary project that this is going to live and this is going to affect their lives, you know, for a, a very long time and it could be a long process and um, being able to, to communicate that, even if that, that's more qualitative information, you know, that informs them signing a personal release. Um, on the side of the agreements with the filmmakers, and I think that this is really important you know, with independent filmmakers, if they're working with a production company in a sort of co-producer way, is, you know, for us, as we see when we work with filmmakers, not everyone has the appetite or the capacity to continue the life of their film. That's one of the services that Cartenquin offers, is that, you know, 15 years down the road, we're still going to be doing your reporting for, you know, the independent television service money, or we're still going to be, if that college, you know, reaches out to us to do a screening, like, we'll still handle that and then get the royalties to you. So I think that that sort of perpetuity, like being able to, to manage that film um, from a filmmaker in a co-production agreement is really key, so that the film can live on beyond the filmmaker's, you know, potential capacity or interest to keep distributing it, self-distributing it. Okay, good. Uh, Pat, from your perspective as a screenwriter, what's, what's most important for you to, I guess, see for yourself in the any rights agreement? Yeah, I mean, I think going off what Brian and Jolene had, like on, on the producing side, it's that it, it's clean language, it's kind of perpetuity, right? It's like, I wanna make sure that I can do what I need to do to continue to create success for the movie. Um, you know, as a screenwriter and as, you know, someone like creating IP and then going off to partner with bigger entities, whether they're investors or, um, you know, production, other production entities, bigger distributors. Um, again, that, that's one of those like negotiation spots. Um, but, you know, they're, yeah, as an artist, right, like credit becomes something that's really important, um, you know, attachment to a project going forward, right? Like if I write a script um, and I want to direct it, um, you know, am I in some sort of right of first refusal position to do so? Um, you know, or, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on bringing a, a feature length documentary project um, into production right now where, um, you know, we had a funder that was interested and then they sent us back an agreement that basically said like, hey, we can fire your whole team and do whatever we want. Well, like, that's not, that's not going to work, right? Like that, you know, um, so, you know, I, it, it does ultimately kind of start to boil down to uh, degrees of control. And I don't mean that in any kind of like, you know, power mad way, like I need to control everything. It's more like, you know, can I protect the quality of the project? Can I protect, you know, if there's a, a you know, I guess, ethical or um, 
you know, I don't know, uh, creative desire to, to have certain people or, or certain elements attached to it. Um, and, and all of those things are going to be negotiated in different ways, right? There, there might be a world where I'm like, hey, you know, I just want to sell this screenplay and then you can do whatever you want with it. And that's okay too sometimes. Um, so it, it's going to vary between the project, but it's, you know, it's, it's looking at, you know, what's, what's important for me, what's important for the project and the people who have got it to that place and making sure that those interests are represented. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think it was you, Brian, that you meant use the word option and that uh, refers to the structure of how these rights agreements are, are typically set up, whereby um, uh, there isn't necessarily an acquisition of rights immediately, but there is the ability of whoever is taking the option to acquire those rights later on. And um, uh, what, uh, what, what do you look for, Brian, in terms of your rights under, under an option agreement with respect to what, what that structure is? Do, do you, does that work for you? Uh, does, do, do you? Are you inclined to be thinking about just acquiring the rights ahead of time or how does it work? Well, what we do is um, we'll typically option something through our production company and then at a later moment in time, once the project is green lit or looks like it's gonna move forward, you know, we're, uh, we're small and scrappy, so we're constantly financing. So we don't uh, necessarily wait till all the pieces are in place. But at some point we decide, okay, this is happening. And then we'll um, set up an LLC for the project and um, potentially, you know, make a decision that we're gonna, op we're gonna exercise the option. As to when that happens, you know, that's, that can vary from project to project. But, um, you know, we're trying to do it with as little of a cost as possible, but that obviously that has a lot to do with the nature of the project. And we want the flexibility to have enough time to develop the project and then um, and get it off the ground before we have to exercise. In other words, um, you know, most of the money, and we're not talking about big money in our stuff, but most of the money is in not the option, but in the exercise of the option. So we want to make sure that before we actually spend or raise the money to exercise the option that we've had enough time to kind of make sure the project can can happen and um, and then typically we'll get have a renewal uh, capability you know right now is a perfect example of why you know you you need some flexibility in your option term you know we have a, a fourth film that's in development that we would be shooting right now I am very confident that we'd be shooting it right now if it wasn't for COVID-19, but we've now pushed it back to next spring or summer. And, um, you know, without, without enough sort of uh, space in the option, we'd have, a, we'd have a real problem. We'd run the risk of losing all our work or having to start over and renegotiating again. And that, I guess, one thing I'd mentioned about when we were talking about this, or the last question, that's another key thing is get it all in from, from the beginning don't ever assume you're going to go back and fix terms because <laughs> it's just not the way it's going to work. You know, um, if, if it's worth, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not going to work that way. So you have to, you have to take care of it no matter how, how challenging it is to work through everything from the off onset. Well, that, that's good. I, I was going to ask you in today's environment, what you thought the, the, the period of time would be for, for the options and, and of course this is all negotiable uh, and and you're right about extensions there can be multiple extensions to, but uh, what what would be your thought as far as what, what you would need is a year two years how many options today i think you, i think you would need two years right now because i don't you know who knows if that you know part of the problem and others might have a different experience with this right now but is it's hard to it's it's hard, it, it, financing a feature film tends to coincide with kind of having the momentum of going towards production. In other words, ha financing a film when it, it's like, when are we gonna produce it? I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit harder. And uh, so you can't, there's just a lot that can't really get done. You can only do so much, and then you kind of have to figure out when you're gonna actually, you're gonna actually be able to make it. So I, I think you need two years right now, you know, I think, I think we normally do a year and a half. I'd have to look it up to be sure. With a one year and a half, a year or a year and a half extension is in our typical. 
but I think if I was doing an option agreement today, would would look to extend that at least another six months to to get two years, just just to figure that the next twelve months with COVID nineteen could just be a, a complete, you know, wash. Okay, just from a technical point of view, the uh, the option is something that belongs to the producer. It's not a mutual option. Mutual options are are not enforceable. It's simply an agreement to an agree. So it's it's an option solely with the, the producer to to acquire the rights and um, the the length of the option, the number of, of extensions, the lengths of the extensions, all all negotiable. And uh, the consideration that is paid is uh, anywhere from a dollar to maybe up to 10% perhaps of, of the purchase price at a really, really high end. But the uh, um, quite often the what you see is that the amount that's spent for the initial option is something that may offset what the purchase price is, but the amounts that would be spent on the extensions would not be something that would offset the uh, be offset against the, 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 the purchase price. So it's a matter of, of you looking at your project, trying to figure out really what are your requirements. It may be that if, if you miss a season, you got to wait till the next season, in which case you really have to have a long option agreement. If it's something that you can start at any point within the year, well, then you've got a little more flexibility, but that is going to depend on um, project by project. So um, I know you don't do um, options. Are, are, there, are there options involved, Jolene, in any of your process in, well, in the documentary? We're working on a project right now with Frontline where it, the genesis of it was a book. So um, they are optioning, but Frontline's optioning the book and we're going to produce the film. I mean, we have some interesting situations on the other side of it, of, um, in particular with Hoop Dreams, um, people optioning Hoop Dreams um, to want to recreate, uh, you know, a fiction project or even a musical um, that really uh, follows the story, um, you know, so that's an unusual option. I don't think comes up, you know, a lot necessarily in the documentary realm um, versus the life rights question. But no, we are doing, we are working on a book right now, but we're, we're just not the ones engaging in the, in the optioning process. Okay. Uh, Pat, any thoughts on uh, options, extensions, things like that? No, I mean, you guys have kind of covered most of it, right? It's all negotiable. That's, you know, again, I, I like what Brian had to say, which is like in this climate, you know, that typical kind of one year term probably isn't going to cut it, you know, just because there's so many variables. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm mostly looking at that from the side of people optioning my things and, you know, everything's pretty much been covered in what you guys talked about. Okay, good. Um, let's look at the, 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 the scope of rights. And when you look at a at a property, I know Brian, you said you want to have as much flexibility as, as possible. Do you build in, say, uh, are you going to do a film or is it film and television? Both is, uh, I, I know you'd have all, all manners of exploitation of whatever property you end up with, but uh, is there anything particular about the, the scope of rights in, in the agreement that, that you look for? We look to acquire all the rights to the property so that we have, um, you know, all all manners of exploitation because you just don't know where the things are going to take you, you know. And uh, it's um, it's one of these things, you know. The thing about rights are you 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 really over negotiate typically up front because you have to, and by that I just mean you want to get as much as you possibly can, and 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 the by over, I mean that most of that stuff will never happen. You know, our, I remember, and I don't remember if we have these in all of our rights, but I remember, I think we do have them, but I think we, I remember we, I think we ended up negotiating, you know, rights to all kinds of derivative properties, whether it was sequels, which, you know, I guess is more reasonable, television spinoffs, um, musical theater or, you know, theatrical adaptations. It's all kind of gets in there. And in, on some level, it feels a little silly. If the thing isn't even made, and in most cases, you're not going to ever have to worry about any of that. But it is that risk that if you're successful and you haven't contemplated that stuff, it makes it much more difficult to go back and renegotiate that after, you know, success. So it's like, I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of, 
you're doing a lot up front that you probably don't need, but it uh, it makes life a lot easier down the road. Well, that, that is particularly true today. We know how the, essentially the conversion of, of film and, and television is for a property to be made is kind of hard to detect whether that was made for television or if it was made for a film exhibition. Of course, if you've got something episodic, then that's, that's a different matter, but you could acquire rights with a film in mind, but it turns into an episodic project and you want to make sure that you've got that to do so. Uh, Pat, are there any rights that you keep in mind that you want to hold on to as a screenwriter that you want to reserve from a rights agreement? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, you, you always want to keep yourself attached, right? Or unless you don't, but let's assume you do. Um, you know, so if, you know, the, the company you're working with, you know, has the rights to do the TV thing you know, off of your movie, like you want to be included in that in whatever way is, is appropriate for you, whether that's financial or creative. Um, you know, I think also like to some degree recognizing, you know, what is some of the potential for the property, right? Like there's the very famous, um, you know, Star Wars story of like 20th Century Fox said like, yeah, sure, go ahead, George Lucas, you can have the rights to action figures and these kind of things. Like this movie's not going to be anything. And that became how he built his like empire, right? So like, as the artist, right, if you have foresight, there's, you know, places to not, not necessarily to exploit, but like to, um, you know, protect yourself or gain more, right? Like you might you know, believe in some aspect of the project that someone doesn't understand. Uh, and, and, you know, you can, you know, hold on to those things. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's always a give and take, right? It's always a consideration. You know, some of the projects that I've had to do in the early parts of my you know, career, it's like um, I'm giving up quite a bit in terms of ownership or, or rights to it, but I would never get to make this project if I didn't. So like, you know, what's the value for me? You know, in, in addition to the life of the project, you've got the life of your career, right? And it's like, okay, you know, I might, I might take the loss on this one in some respect, but does that get me to the next larger step, um, you know, where, where I can continue to grow and, and get to the places that I want to be as a creative person? Um, so I think there's definitely considerations, right? It's um, as the creator, you know, it's not just dollars and cents. I mean, a lot of it can boil down to that, but, but for some artists, right, that doesn't matter at all, right? For some artists, it is purely um, passion and art and, and creative, um, so, you know, that's where you start to get into a little bit of the subjective, you know, what really matters to that person and that filmmaker. Okay. Uh, Jolene, the uh, area of credits on, on documentary films, do you, do you have any issues uh, there that you, you'd like to address? I know that there's something that's broader in a rights agreement, but of course it applies to you even if you're doing yeah. you know, just releases. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the area of credits of like, um, are you talking about specifically like participant collaboration or executive producer or all of it? Well, when, <laughs> whenever it is that you're dealing with somebody that is making a contribution, say on the, on the right side, whether that's a release or whatever, do you, what, what kind of credit issues do you, do you have with, uh, with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's because documentary is sort of an unfolding of a story often, at least in the way in which Cartemquin works, like it can be, you know, sort of difficult from that sort of jump start to say, you're going to have a writing credit or, you know, I, I've seen this on other projects I've worked on outside of Cartemquin as well, like, you know, discussing should we have these, um, you know, three participants have co-writing credits. And I think that that that's kind of an an evolutionary process. Um, so I know that we're talking about right at the start, but um, it's not always very clear, like what those credits would be for those participants if they, you know, would have credits. I think that they're often can get um, another question around credits that can come up is, um, you know, around editors receiving a writing credit as well, you know, comes into documentary a little bit later. Um, but I think one thing that is relevant for us in documentary that we've really learned in close collaboration with our legal team this year is um, the sort of executive producer role early on. And, um, you know, there's been just a lot of conversation about people attaching to a project um, for, you know, getting an EP credit at a, at a smaller level as um, equity investment has become more um, common in documentary. And, um, 
you know, the, we've worked um, with the documentary, um, the DPA Documentary Producers Association to establish some crediting guidelines around that, where this is the sort of percentage of the budget that at a, for a documentary would make sense for someone to get this kind of credit. But on the legal side, where we've seen that sort of be problematic really, you know, early on or something you should be considering early on when you get those investors is like certain funders within public broadcasting, like independent television service, they're very bristly around the idea that someone might just pay for money and not really have a substantive role in the production. They might just pay for a credit. So they, you know, part, part of, partially because public broadcasting, you know, receives public dollars. And so they would need to vet those EPs to ensure that they actually had a contribution to the project outside of just money. So that's something that we're sort of a new area of education for us to think about credits if you have people coming in really early on at the investment stage and it's a project that might end up on public television, which a lot of our projects, you know, have gone on to ITVS, you know, PBS, Independent Lens, POV broadcasts. Um, it's a new concern for us. It's like the legal ramifications of having an EP attached within a public broadcasting system. Okay, good point. Pat, what, uh, what's critical for you on, on the credit side when you look at a, a rights agreement? What, what do you look for? What do you need to see? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, on the producing side, it's, you know, whatever your, um, you know, crew agreements are, right? Like the, the people you're working with, both talent and, you know, um, creatives and, and you're, you know, below the line people. Um, it's just having that explicit in those that documentation right so it's documented um right away on the you know on the indie side it's a little different right like as a writer once you get to like the studio level like the guild handles a lot of that stuff and they have their rules and you know they just kind of lay it out and that's how it works um you know as an independent person you're a little bit more kind of fighting for your own uh, thing and I think again it's just that's going to be that's that's been written into whether it's work for hire things that I've done as a writer or um, you know projects that I've, I've produced on my own or, or with partners you know that's that's pretty much always written into whatever um, option and or services agreement you know creates the script is you know this person the writer they will be credited as a b c and d um, and you know, there's, there's usually some, some little language there, um, you know, about kind of um, possible flexibility to it. But usually if you're, you're the writer, um, that's going to be pretty protected unless there's like a substantial kind of rework or rewrite of the thing. So again, it's, you know, it's protecting yourself or, you know, if it's a project you don't want your name on, maybe that's something that you're a little more, you know, free to, to give up. Um, but Alan Smithy? You know, is yeah, right, right. Um, you know, and just especially, um, you know, in the lower budget space, right, sometimes you're working on things where the credit is almost your only payment um, or like some deferred pay that's probably never going to show up. Um, so, you know, there that, that does become important, right? Even if it's a friend or a friendly thing, it's like, well, if I'm doing this for nothing, um, you know, I need at least the, the agreement in place that, that shows how I'm tied to the project in name, uh, you know, if it gets a claim or, or otherwise. Okay, good. Brian, any, any thoughts on, on credit? Is any any rights agreements for you there that you look for? You know, at the rights level so far for us, that, that part of it's been pretty straightforward and clean. So it really hasn't been much. We've had, a, you know, a couple of our projects have been, had two screenwriters, but um, that's, you know, we've been fortunate that we haven't had egos getting in the way really in terms of, you know, making that more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that a rights agreement can, can, uh, and should deal with is what it is that the producer can do during the period of the option and before the exercise of the rights. And, um, Obviously, there's going to be development work that goes on as far as the attached talent and, and that, but I can think of a couple things that uh, a, a screenwriter might be, might be you know, sensitive about. One would be rewriting the script, uh, bringing in a co-writer, and kind of, the other would be perhaps producing a trailer. And um, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, Brian? Uh, you know, with rewrites, it's, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of times there are some provisions built into an option for a certain amount of 
rewriting. But um, when you have um, a writer director situation, it's pretty fluid in terms of they just want to make the project as great as they can be. It's, it's a little different when you have a writer that's compartmentalized and a director who's separated. And we haven't really had a situation like that because ours have been all fairly organic, but I could see where that would be a bit of a problem. And we have had director, uh, you know, with a, with, with, we've had directors pretty heavily involved in rewriting for sure. Um, other people's work, but, um, you know, I, I think that's something that you should anticipate. And I'm talking about from a producer standpoint and build in a little bit of whatever your expectations are up front, especially if the, if you're acquiring a project where the writer is not going to be the director. Um, if the writer's going to be the director, chances are they're going to, they're just, it'll, it'll have some, they'll, they'll rewrite it on their own volition as opposed to you having to say, I need a, I need this rewritten. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, well, it just had to do with what rights the producer wants to have with respect to the script that, that essentially involved the exercise of rights prior to the exercise of the option. When you are making the trailer, for example, you're producing. And a lot of times the, the purchase price is due within X amount of time of commencement of principal photography. So you'd want to make sure if you're going to do a trailer that that doesn't constitute the exercise of your option. But you don't have the rights at the point that you're making the trailer. So um, yeah, I, I just bring that up as an issue to, to uh, uh, along with rewriting, where you are actually doing things with the script before you've actually acquired the rights. Yeah, trailers are usually done when the movie is finished. I mean, it's one of the last things. We're actually working on that right now for Dreaming Grand Avenue. Um, there is the you know you sometimes though will do um some sort of a teaser to try to raise money that was you know right. or, or that's to what i meant by the trailer yeah. sorry if was, yeah i didn't mean to confuse yeah um and chances are i mean i you know that you 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 won't be um you won't really be using the intellectual property in that because you haven't shot any footage yet you don't have anything you might be working with the talent you might be working with the history of either the production company or or in some other way but that could be i mean it could be an area issue i mean, i guess another question i would have for to, for you and for everybody else because i think there's one happening tonight that sega after is doing which is staged readings of materials um that's kind of a public performance on a certain level i you know i assume those are covered in options i can't remember <laughs> it's been a while since i've looked at the fine print um, I don't know, Pat, how, how do you feel about those, those kinds of, with the, say, somebody coming in and uh, doing doing rewrites on, on a script that you've optioned? Yeah, um, I mean, again, it's going to be a negotiated thing. I think what's pretty standard is for the writer to negotiate that they get to do the first rewrite, right? And, you know, if, if it's going to go away from them at some point, um, they at least get the first crack at it. You know, that's that's very common. Um, you know, in terms of what Brian's saying, staged readings, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I've seen the language, right, in, in agreements, but usually I feel like if you're doing staged readings, like they're into the development period or, um, you know, possibly leading up to actual production. Uh, so I, I feel like it wouldn't necessarily um, get into like the purchase price mode. But yeah, you know, same thing, right? As as before with with rewrites and things, it's like you you at least want that that crack at the apple, um, and you know, if you have a lot of sway, you could probably say no one can rewrite it except for me. You know, as as you know, your clout you know cr grows, right? The things you can ask for become more significant or at least um, more achievable. And you know, when you're nobody, people are going to treat you like nobody, most likely. Uh, and you just have to still, I think, not be afraid um, to ask to be treated with decency, right? Like even even if you're you know kind of lower on the totem pole. That, that's a really good thought. Uh, we've we've come to what we thought was our break point. What I'd like to do is to give the panelists the first opportunity to ask a question of each other, and then we can move to uh, people and uh, 
who've who've done a, done the Q and A. Do either any of you have a question you'd like to pose to to the other? I guess not. <laughs> or maybe it'll come to you. <laughs> All right, so uh, how are we handling uh, Q&A? Do we just, oh, okay. Well, Tom, we've, we've, uh, we've assembled quite a bunch of interesting questions here. If, if it's okay with you, I'll just, uh, Chris and I'll start and kind of throw these out there and uh, you, can, you can look at the same Q&As. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, let's keep going. All right, so we've got a, a number of very specific ones. This one, um, uh, are, are we going to get into when you do and don't clear images on footage? So the question is, when do you need to clear right of publicity on people in those images and footage? How much leeway do you get with fleeting use? Are you talking about a scripted or a doc? It's a, it sounds, sounds like a, it's doc a documentary, question. yeah. So you've, you've taken some footage and there are people who appear incidentally um, that aren't necessarily the subjects of the documentary. How do you, how do you deal with uh, clearing those rights? Well, so there's some different circumstances, like what, you know, one thing if you're going to be in a space where there's going to be a lot of people and it's not really viable to do releases on all of those people is having a filming notice and filming your filming notice um, so that people understand if they're entering that space that they um, are going to be filmed um, when you're in a situation where there's a lot of people. If you're in a situation where it's sort of outside it sounds like maybe what they're talking about I mean when you're on the street and filming um, you know we, we we typically don't it's part of part it's the capacity too and we when you're out in public you know having the right to be able to shoot if you're on a public street or something um, and permitted we don't c collect releases from every single person who's fleeting who's coming you know in contact but if it's if it's really anybody you're you're talking to or they're um, you know we or they're on frame for an extended period of time or part of, you know, a critical sort of situation in the film. I mean, we do, you know, encourage our filmmakers to have due diligence to get those releases. It's, you're always going to be more protected in having the releases, you know, but it's, a, it's an impossibility if you're going into a public meeting and, you know, there's a hundred people and you're a two person crew, you just, you need to um, work to get the filming notice posted and filming that you, um, that you had that notice posted. All right, uh, then uh, another one of our attendees uh, is working on a documentary and contacted a uh, media organization for the rights to part of a video. Uh, the media company sent the attendee a license form asking questions they don't know how to answer, uh, specifically regarding license period and territory. Uh, the attendee has no idea what's going to happen with the documentary after it's complete. Uh, though they hope to try and make it worldwide, uh, but what is your suggestion uh, as how to answer mm -hmm. uh, territory and period questions? Sure. So, I mean, one of the things that I think when you don't know where um, uh, where the film is going to land, um, you know, one of the things we encourage people to is is to clear something just for festival rights because that's usually a much um, more affordable, um, you know, rights clearance. And, and you can, um, I mean, you obviously, if you can get sort of worldwide perpetuity that, um, that is desirable, if you could negotiate that. Um, I think this person was talking about Al Jazeera. Um, but I think that, you know, what uh, we encourage people to do before paying a significant amount of money if you don't know where this is going to live but you know that at least your first path is the film festival circuit that you would um, clear rights to be able to use it on the festival circuit and that would go for music or um, you know any any other piece of media versus um, trying to you know license something when you don't know what you're going to need um, based on the broadcast requirements and whatnot where it's going to go. I would start with perpetuity worldwide. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> you, 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 yeah, you'll 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 learn some things. One, you'll learn yeah. how much you think it's worth. Number two, you'll learn if there are any impediments. Right. If, uh, if they say, well, okay, we can't give the world because such and such somebody else has got it in such such other territory, and um, it it'll be it'll form the basis of your initial yeah. negotiation, which would be really important. And and ultimately, you may have to deliver that 
to a distributor too. You don't, you don't know, but it, it wouldn't be unusual to find that if somebody's going to be picking it up, they'd want to know that they have the ability to, to release it uh, throughout the world in perpetuity. Right. That's where we always start for sure. But, you know, yes. I think that there's, we see a lot of people who can't, you know, who really want to have a certain piece of content in the, in the project, especially around music. And it's like, that's, you know, might not be viable for your, for your festival run. Ryan made a comment earlier on, uh, and I wrote it down because I thought, well, this is kind of the byline of this, pr of this uh, program, which is, quote, you want to get as much as you can, right? So that's, isn't, that's pretty much what we're talking about here. Get as much as you can, or at least test the waters. Uh, this one, I think, may dovetail back into the conversation about options, but you tell me. Um, how do you go about acquiring rights to a book without having a production financial backing when you typically can't get financial backing without already having the rights? It's sort of a, a cart before the horse. You don't have the you don't have the money to, to pay for the option. Is that, is the that word the option wasn't used in this, but I'm just throwing it out to the group. The, the question is, if you want to um, get rights to a book, but you don't yet have financial backing to do the production, how does that work? I can take that. Um, I would say it, it depends on how popular the book is. I mean, if it's a bestseller, forget about it. Um, but a lot of books are published and have very small profiles. And um, you might reach out directly to the author if you have a way to do that and just kind of check and see what, if anything's been done with it and what their appetite is. And then that will give you a sense for what you're dealing with. And then maybe you can um, option it for a, a reasonable amount of money. Um, you're going to have to put something in good. You're not going to get anything for free. But if it's a, if it's a, um, if it's not a best-selling book, and it's especially if it's a book that's been out for let's say a year or more, chances are you could probably get um, an option done for a very reasonable amount of money. If if you don't have the, the funds, I, I I don't know what the option price might be, but there are there there are documents that um, can be put together where somebody would advance money in anticipation of a project being formed later on. The, these are note agreements, by the way, so they do involve debt and they could involve a repayment obligation. But we, we have been involved with putting these documents together where somebody just doesn't have that, that, um, that war chest in the beginning, but wants to, wants to secure rights in the property and go out and see if they can raise, raise funds for it. So it's, it, it is possible. It's, it's going to be family and friends, really. They'll be supporting you in that effort. And just so, kind of jumping, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just like, you know, I, I, for like cheap and, and possible, like, you know, free or very, very low options, I have heard, you know, people who've kind of like just made a successful kind of pitch to the person. Like if you're extremely passionate about the project or you love the person, love their work, like if, if you can represent yourself well as like a, um, you know, a proper or, you know, loving custodian of the work, like you might be able to make a connection with that person and, you know, get the rights to it, at least for a short time for you know, like, like Brian said, something that's very cost effective. Then sort of building off of this discussion, uh, who should you actually reach out to if you're trying to get the rights to a book? Uh, how do you determine who owns the copyright? Do you contact the author first, the publisher? It really depends on what access you have. Uh, I always prefer to go directly to the author because they are the ones who are going to have the most personal interest in seeing something get done. Anybody that is, and they may, depending on how high profile they are, they may have the gatekeepers that you'll never get to them. So again, there's a wide range of types of authors. The gatekeepers are just, they're, they're there to keep gates away, you know, and so they're going to set bars higher for you and they're going to make it more challenging and more difficult for you to, to gain those options. But, um, and if you don't have, know how to get to the author, then you know, I would uh, try to go to uh, see what kind of agents they have. It, it, if they are active in the uh, film space, and meaning they've licensed other things, they, they might have an agent, a literary agent listed on IMDb. If it's a sort of a pure literary writer who doesn't have 
uh, a history of projects being optioned. You might have to try to use Google to try to figure out who their literary, their literary literary agent is, not to be confused with their literary film agent because they can be different things. There's the book publishing world has a whole realm of literary agents who are, their primary job is to help an author get a book published. The uh, ancillary rights like film and television are part of their purview as well, unless they have a separate author uh, agent for that. But it's not necessarily what they're primarily focused on, at least uh, out of the box. You can go to the copyright office as well and look up the title and it's, there's not a guarantee that you're going to find out uh, information there, but there is a, a, a section that um, can be completed by the copyright owner that will identify who the licensing agent is in the United States. And I've found that useful for, for clients who were stymied. They wanted to move ahead on a project. They thought that they understood who the rights holder was. They weren't getting anywhere. I looked it up in the copyright office and it turned out it was a different party entirely and they were responsive immediately. So um, I, I would I would recommend going there and chances are you're gonna find it. And, uh, information on on the uh, on the agent or perhaps even on who the who the um the author might be i mean you'll know the author but you know what i mean to, to where to contact the author so we have one more question that came up almost at the beginning of this it was based on uh, brian's dis uh, discussion at the very beginning and it had to do with what you i think referred to as an engagement period uh, an informal period and the uh, this person says um do you have an inform for that informal engagement period? Do you have any informal agreement? We do. Yeah, we kind of spell out what um, what we will do, what the expectations are, and uh, and 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 literally say that getting an option agreement done is part of that process. It depends. I mean, so you know, we're in various stages of conversation and negotiation and getting to know people now. Um, we have one project, as I said, that's in development. We've, we've got an option on that. It's already, you know, it's the, the train is rolling and I expect that movie will get made next year if uh, COVID gets out of the way. Um, there's another project that we were close to optioning and we kind of decided to hold off and ask for another rewrite. And um, we've spent a fair bit of time with the, the filmmakers, but, um, haven't put anything on paper yet. So I, I would say there's a range and it really is up to the producer and, uh, and uh, counterparty. But for us, um, if, if we can't, you know, I guess it's because we've done business by handshake in other ways so long that if, that if we can't trust somebody's, um, uh, you know, way of doing business enough to, to spend a little bit of time getting to know them without worrying that they're going to take advantage of us in some way, it's better for us to find that out sooner than later anyway, right? And get a, a get away from a project. So I would say, you know, depending on how much time and energy and potentially resources are being put behind it, you may need an agreement, uh, like a it could be a letter of intent um, or something of that nature. But um, I would say, first of all, just find out if you will like, I mean, you're, you know, the, 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 the language I chose isn't um, incidental. I mean, getting together with a filmmaker as a producer on a project is a little bit like a marriage. You're going to spend a lot of time together. So find out early on if it's a compatible situation. Now, following up on that, that Brian, uh, you, know, the, you, you can't really use an agreement to turn bad faith into good. And, you know, you can't walk away with a document and feel really, really secure about it if you're not dealing with the right person on the other side. So I guess my question would be to all three of you, is there any kind of red flag that, that would uh, uh, alert you to staying out of a transaction, backing away? I think any like observed dishonesty, right? Or like deviation from like, we discuss these terms and then, you know, something else shows up in a document uh, you know, that, that would be a big one. Um, you know, and other things, right. Like the kind of classic, like any, any thing you'd use to read, read a person, right. Like not being straightforward with answering questions, right. Or continued, um, 
dodging of things that are important to the business, uh, you know, not showing up, you know, misrepresenting things, all that stuff, you know, usually if, if someone's that kind of person, you can observe it relatively quickly, I feel like. For documentary, I mean, I feel like it's, a, you know, because we have typically are starting from a starting point of having a relationship, um, you know, one of the things that is really a uh, strong consideration for us is like the ethical implications of their documentary practice, um, because that's, that's an area where Kotemkin has been, you know, really focused on throughout its history of like how you're treating participants, how you're sort of ethically moving in the space um, where you're telling the story. And um, so it becomes a little bit more of like getting to know the filmmaker's practice and understand if it's compatible with the way the organization um, works. Um, I mean, we'll do, sometimes before we'll go into a full co-production agreement, we typically do like a development period with a filmmaker. Um, and even before that, we can, so we've done where we've sent like deal terms um, just so we can start moving. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking more and more at, at how those development terms or, or deals are structured so that they're not as much of a long lead period um, and we can move into co-pro, um, whether that be copyright at Cartemquin or a production service agreement, that we can make that move um, so that it's actually just cleaner for the project. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one thing we might be wary of from a documentary standpoint is you know someone who's over promising a lot of like financing um you know and it's it's like oh i've got you know this celebrity connection that's going to help fund the film or this you know person in my back pocket like that's a little bit we don't see that a lot i, I would say but i mean that's a little bit of a red flag because it is like a really it's a partnership and we want people that are going to be honest about the resources for the project yeah, I'll just jump on that, right? Excessive name dropping is a huge red flag. Like excessive <laughs> name dropping means that that person themselves is generally not capable of doing the business. All right. And it, uh, is, it is, go, go ahead, Chris. No, go uh, ahead, Tom. Sorry about that. I, I was going to say this is the courtship period and the person treating you during that courtship period is supposedly treating you in the best way that they know how. And they have to have to think through well what is this person going to be like when it becomes difficult because it's going to get difficult at some point it always does with somebody sometime so anyway that's that's my own observation brian did you have any thought about red flags at all no i mean i think so you know there there, there are things you find out down the road in a project that you might not have found out uh, at the beginning, or you might misjudge somebody, but I think, um, you know, I think, I think you, you, you have your intuition, you get your sense for somebody. I think you just decide we all make these, you know, we, we can all kind of make these decisions when you spend, when you spend a little time with somebody is, do they trust, you know, are they trustworthy? I, I would just say, yeah, be wary of the, the sort of uh, fast talking hype machine. You do run into those folks once in a while and, you know, they're like, they talk really fast. They drop a lot of names and you don't even know what they've said. And, and, you know, then you sort of wonder, wow, you know, and that, but, but, but I just find that that's just not, you know, for me, it's like, who do I want to hang out with for a while? Because if you don't like want to spend a lot of time with that person, I, you know, none of these projects are, are, you know, guaranteed gold. In fact, you know, most of what we do is, is a real struggle to push a rock up a hill and, you just need to want to be around people. That's, that, that's I think, and that's, so it's just a personal assessment over time of, of what kind of person you're dealing with. Especially in documentary, you're going to be in the trenches for a long time, typically, <laughs> at least to the kinds of films that we make. So that, that's really key that you have that collaborative relationship. Great advice. Uh, Chris, I'm sorry, you had a question? No, all good. I went, Somebody asked, uh, when it comes to creating an original narrative based on a historical event, when do you need the rights of people involved uh, and books that have covered the subject? Um, not, not necessarily. There's, there's no copyright in facts, for example. And um, if you're just telling the, the, the story, then, and, and you're just relying on the factual 
events of that of that story, then that's that hasn't been created by anybody in a way that would give them protection. Now, if somebody writes a book that uh, is is particularly well known and maybe has a narrative that's been fashioned, Hamilton, for example, uh, you, you know, you you get rights from that book because there are things that you want from that author. There are things that you do want to borrow, even though you, you do research and you find out that that Henry Henry you know, the Eighth had had fifteen wives. You know, um, you discovered that, but you didn't create it. So that that fact can be used by by other people. But you you may want to to take some things that are are originating with with the author, and you want that author's cooperation. And you want whatever it is that you can do to tie yourself with that project. So, uh, so there, there can be there are a lot of a lot of things back and forth. And it's best, I think, to to have that conversation with your attorney rather than make a judgment on your own. I I just wanted to add on that because we have this project now that is an option via Frontline. And then I also recall that one of our films had an option cooked. Um, Judith Helfand's film about the heat wave in Chicago in the 90s had an option with Alex, Alex Kotlowitz. And that the, in both of those cases, um, you know, Alex was a really deep collaborator as the author. And we anticipate that Nick in this new relationship, he's been involved every step of the way. And so from the documentary perspective, it is, it's, you know, not optioning and walking away, but there's, there's like quite a bit of collaboration um, to make sure that the ideas are translated in, into film form because it's often more ideas for documentaries than necessarily blow by blow story or narrative. So they become like consultants. I have a question that's a little bit off the beaten path here maybe, um, and it has to do with COVID. It's come up just a little bit in this conversation. Um, you know, are there, are there issues now that in projects that you have underway that are being in some way um, you know, some issue being magnified as a result of COVID or looking at the other side of the equation in terms of, of uh, acquisition of rights that you're going through now, that you're incorporating the, the uh, risks and potential uncertainties of COVID in the way you deal with the acquisition of those rights. Don't all talk at once. <laughs> the project we have in development is certainly affected by COVID in the sense that um, it has uh, both, you know, party scenes. So you have groups of people, and it has a lot of intimacy. Both of both things that are challenging to pull off. You know, it's not the screenplay you would write for a COVID nineteen environment. So, um, you know, but that's like I said, we're 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 being rosy eyed, perhaps, and optimist that there will be a time when parties and intimacy are back. <laughs> in our in our lives and in our culture and if they're not then you know we got bigger problems i think overall than whether this movie gets made yeah. um i i haven't we have we haven't ventured into anything you know we our plate's pretty full short term so we, we haven't really gotten into what you're describing in terms of prospectively putting um i'm guessing you're saying some sort of maybe a covet writer or something some sort First of majeure or something like that yeah yeah i mean i know there's a lot of activity around insurance um and uh, and obviously we were there's a lot of talk at, at the uh, national level of um indemnification for businesses in general for COVID 19 issues i mean there, you know it's it's a it's a terminal illness right or potentially terminal illness that um is contagious so it it's something that will have to be dealt with once we know more about how it's going to manifest you know in in perpetuity or if it's just going to disappear it, it could have an effect into, on, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Uh, I was going to say it enters into investor perspective on, on film investment because uh, it, it's really hard to, to project. It's hard enough to project anyway, but we don't know necessarily what the revenue models are going to turn out to be. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the, it may be that the, there's not a significant uh, change. It may be that the change we all foresaw is just accelerated. But we, we don't know f for sure. And, and what, what Brian is mentioning about production insurance is, is correct. If somebody puts investment in a film, 
they, they were going to expect that there's going to be E and O coverage for for the content, but uh, there's this whole other risk of of what happens in the event that uh, protocols aren't followed in the production of the film in some kind of way. So you've got that additional risk of of uh, depleting the resources of the entity that's making the film because of, of claims associated with uh, with the pandemic. So there's that. It's just creating a lot more uncertainty about an uncertain form of investment in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right, thinking thinking through a force majeure clause at the begin at the outset instead of looking backward and trying to decide whether it applies uh, gets very complicated in the construction field, and I'm sure it does in in uh, film as well. Sure, mm -hmm. I, I would just say for documentary, like you know, part of the um, challenge that has you know been really highlighted is how much our filmmakers above the line folks are you know basically waiting till the sale at the end to be paid and this has like really disrupted the marketplace in terms of sales at the acquisition phase and that's just been a real challenge um, as we're trying to see the dust settle and what happens we've had a few things sell but um, there's some things that we thought had really strong chances that um, you know we're still waiting to see what happens so that's been that's been a challenge, and we have a program with Hulu that's sort of a development program um, where they have a first look deal, and you know that whole timeline has been kind of disrupted um, to be able to actually you know get the product in front of them and and decide if they want it to be a Hulu original. Um, so, yeah. Can I just ask? Are you seeing? Um... Uh, COVID uh, virus, COVID restrict uh, exclusions in insurance policies that you would normally uh, see without it. Has that come up? We haven't because we're not in production or going into it. But I've definitely heard that it's it's basically a, a deal breaker. Uh, I don't know if it's evolved in the last few weeks or not, mm -hmm. but it's it basically shuts down independent production because there yeah. is you know it's it's not obtainable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the same advice we had from our brokers. Okay, we have one interesting question. I'm not exactly sure how to phrase it here, but it's it has it's not has nothing to do with COVID. It's um, I think it relates to Tom's discussion of facts and when when you um, you know have to get rights to facts versus uh, stories. So this the question is: What if a native story wasn't written, but it's kept as an oral tradition in a native community? And maybe you could look at that also just from the standpoint of what, when does a, a story, a native story, if, it, if you will, um, become something that you have to have rights to? It's going to depend upon the story. If, if it's something that, um, you know, how, how old it was, for example, it may be in the public domain because of its age. The copyright material, copyright also protects things that are, are captured in some kind of tangible form. So that that would be an issue. I think we'd have to look at the at the, the circumstances of this with those considerations in mind, plus the fact that uh, there, there may not have ever been a registration made, probably not if it was if it was an oral tradition. It's an interesting question, but I, I those are a couple couple issues that just come to mind initially. I would assume it falls into the same kind of realm as a as a speech, right? I mean, if it's oral, it's still copyrighted. It's just a question of what the age of the material is. And yeah. the other thing you'd have to be careful about is if you heard it. Let's say you you know you, you're not from that um, native group, but you heard it performed somewhere. It's very possible that somebody has taken a an, a, an old story and recrafted it their own way, and that they create a copyright then around that. So it really, you know, it's not inherently probably copyrighted if it's old though, right? It's probably more likely to be in the public domain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we're, we're, it looks like we're right up against the uh, 90 minute uh, mark here. Um, and a very interesting conversation, I thought. Thank you very much to our panelists and to all those who attended. We didn't get through all the questions, but we, I thought we got through a good uh, chunk of them. So um, 
I, I, I was going to go back to the you want to get as much as you can line from Brian. Uh, that still seems to Is be that the new title of the series. <laughs> to be the whole thing. It's such a it's such a lawyer's way of looking at things, and I I, you're, I don't think you are you have a degree in law, so I was very impressed. With that. <laughs> um, but in any case, again, thanks to all and um, someone in there asked about how do you find a lawyer to help you on a specific matter, and uh, I have a, a three letter. Um, answer to that, which is LCA. Um, so Lawyers for the Creative Arts and other organizations like us, we are just one of maybe 50 around the country. Um, we're the sole one in, in the state of Illinois. Uh, but there are VLAs, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, uh, in most cities, uh, most certainly most big cities and most medium-sized cities as well. Um, so for those who are listening from outside the state of Illinois, uh, I would approach that. Um, usually a, very, a good source to start with. So again, we are, uh, 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 Chris, when is, what, when is our next program? We'll be notifying everybody who signed up for this as well as our uh, the rest of our list, but what is the date of our next one? Yes, I, as Jan mentioned at the, at the start, this is the first in an ongoing series on film law principles. The next program is scheduled for Thursday, August 27th uh, at the same time, uh, 3 p.m. to 4.30. Uh, and like Jan said, I, as attendees of this program, you'll all get an email reminding you of the next one uh, and providing that registration information. All right. Well, with that, I think um, we are ready to adjourn this, this Zoom meeting. So thanks again for everybody. Hope you have a great day. And, Thank and you, everyone. Thank weekend. you. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you. We had a great time. Bye. Bye-bye.